Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about the living world. Topic for the day is going to be hormone regulation and as I've made my intro I have just realized that I'm in need of a new intro and exit phrase. So if you got any suggestions leave me a comment. Either way, I'm talking about hormone regulation today. So here are your objectives. By the end of this video I'll be able to explain the difference between a simple endocrine pathway and a simple neuroendocrine pathway. Explain the concept of antagonistic hormone pairs and discuss the causes of diabetes mellitus. So, first up, let's talk about endocrine versus neuroendocrine signaling. And it's all about where you begin. So, here's what we mean by this in a simple endocrine signal, there is just hormones that are secreted into the bloodstream. Those hormones take off, they find their target cell, and they cause an action within that cell. Neuroendocrine signaling begins with a neuro signal or a signal coming out of the nervous system. So there are cells called neuroendocrine cells. Those cells will really, well, sorry, words are hard this morning. Um, those cells will receive a signal from a sensory cell somewhere out in the body. So it would be a nerve cell that is set up for sensing. When that sensory cell receives a signal, it'll send that signal along to a neuroendocrine signal that, or neuroendocrine cell. That neuroendocrine cell will then secrete a signal to an endocrine cell, which will secrete a hormone. So it's just a little bit longer pathway. Neuroendocrine signaling starts with a signal out of the nervous system. Endocrine signaling just starts with an endocrine organ. Now, as we're talking about hormones, all hormones are controlled off of some sort of feedback. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on feedback loops because we've talked about them several times before. Remember that a negative feedback loop is a situation where the end product ends up regulating the starting phase. So once you've got plenty of the end product, it shuts down the process. Positive feedback loop pushes a thing on through to completion or amplifies a response. I do want to give you two concrete examples, though. So the first one for a negative feedback loop is a hormone called secretin that is put out by the pancreas in response to the pH of the small intestine. So what happens is as things are getting digested in the stomach, they are getting mixed and made into a substance called chyme, which is highly acidic. It's got a lot of stomach acid in it um, from the digestive juices. When that chyme is pushed through to the small intestine, obviously it lowers the pH of the small intestine because it's very acidic. So in response to that situation where the pH of the intestine has been lowered, secretin is secreted, which causes the pancreas to put out uh, carbonate ions, which is going to raise the pH and kind of balance out the pH of the small intestine. So that would be a feedback loop because once the pH goes back to normal, it shuts down the process. Now, opposite of the situation is lactation in mothers who are suckling a baby, and this is related to the hormone oxytocin. Um, this is an example of a neuroendocrine pathway where in the nipples of mothers there are nervous cells that when stimulated send a signal to the brain to secrete oxytocin which causes lactation and stimulation of those nervous cells in the nipple by a child suckling causes the response to get greater which causes the secretion of more milk which causes more suckling and you see how this goes until the baby has finished feeding and then once the baby has finished feeding the stimulation goes away and the process slows down so differences between a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop know both of those uh, examples in case you have to pull them out of your pocket at any point in time and let's continue on in the endocrine system balance is key obviously in the body balance is key and the way that um, the endocrine system maintains balance is through antagonistic pairs. And what these are is they are pairs of hormones that have opposite effects of one another. Usually both are regulated off of negative feedback. And when the body needs to balance in one direction, it uses one hormone. And when it needs to balance in the other direction, it uses another hormone. So depending on which way the, the body needs to balance, one of the hormones will go into effect. And they're called antagonistic because they are opposite of each other and their effects are opposite of each other. So by pulling in each direction, the body can maintain balance. Now, one of the best recognized and most used examples of an antagonistic pair is insulin and glucagon. And these two 
hormones are responsible for balancing our blood sugar, which you're probably already associating with diabetes. We'll talk about that in a second. But here's what we got. Homeostasis. Normally, you should have about 90 milligrams of glucose per 100 milliliters of blood. And there are two ways that this can go. So let's say that your blood sugar is low. You've just been working out or something. Your body's used up all of the glucose in your blood. Here's what's going to happen. Low blood sugar is going to stimulate the pancreas. Pancreas is going to sec secrete a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon stimulates the liver to break glycogen down into glucose. That breakdown puts glucose into the bloodstream, which goes back and balances the blood sugar and shuts down this process, negative feedback. So pancreas, glucagon, which stimulates uh, glycogen, break down into glucose, which releases blood sugar into, or sugar into the bloodstream. Opposite direction. If the blood sugar is too high, that again stimulates the pancreas, except for this time the pancreas releases insulin. And the purpose of insulin is to stimulate a couple things. One, it stimulates glycogen formation. So that would be storage of that glucose in the liver in the form of glycogen. So that's going to pull some glucose out of the bloodstream. It also stimulates almost all cells in the body to take in glucose. So it just kind of sucks that glucose out of the blood. And, you know, through the combination of your cells picking up glucose and the uh, liver making glycogen, obviously that lowers the blood sugar, which restores homeostasis and shuts off the pathway. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of diabetes mellitus. This is a situation where the body is not able to regulate its blood sugar properly. We'll talk about why not in a second. Common symptoms of diabetes, uh, high blood sugar. So doctors just do a simple blood test. If the blood sugar is above that 90 milligrams per 100 milliliters mark, then it's possible that the body is not properly pulling uh, glucose out of blood. Also, because of this, you have lots of urine. So the kidneys aren't able to pick up all of the sugar out of the blood, and then by osmosis, the sugar, like the high solute concentration of the blood, causes a greater, uh, I guess, directional flow of water into the bloodstream. And so there's a greater production of urine, which means that a symptom of diabetes is that you have to urinate a lot. Also, when you urinate, um, because sugar is not being pulled out of the blood properly, there's a lot of sugar in the urine. Those would be like some diagnostic symptoms. Now, if diabetes progresses, you get tons of things. Like <clears throat> the glucose circulating in the bloodstream can cause crystallization of sugar in the capillaries, uh, especially of the eyes, which can lead to blindness. Um, or if it crystallizes and damages the capillaries of fingers and toes, there's loss of circulation. So there's a lot of really bad symptoms that come up as diabetes progresses. Now, diabetes can be broken into two types. Um, there's type 1, type 2. Type 1 is generally known as juvenile diabetes. It is a lot more rare. This is only like 10% of diabetes cases. And basically what happens is in type 1, the body doesn't make insulin. Um, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where the body actually kills off the cells in the pancreas that create insulin. So because the body has killed off those cells that create insulin, insulin cannot be secreted in response to high blood sugar, which means that the body is not able to get that signal to tell the cells, hey, you need to take in blood sugar now. So di uh, type 1 diabetes is generally going to be treated through an insulin regimen and, you know, like I said, this is generally diagnosed in kids, so they will have to live a life where they're going to have to take insulin um, pretty much all the time. Now, this is in contrast to type 2 diabetes, which is the one that we hear about quite frequently. Um, in type 2 diabetes, the body is still making insulin properly, but body cells fail to respond to insulin. So that insulin is flying around in the bloodstream, but they aren't recognizing it, which means that they aren't getting the signal that they need to take up that sugar out of the bloodstream. Um, type 2 diabetes is generally associated with some sort of inflammatory response in the body. Um, it has been associated with high body weight and several lifestyle uh, choices that can you know, break down this ability of cells to pick up insulin. Now, 
good news is that type 2 diabetes can generally be managed through diet and exercise. If it gets bad, it needs to be managed through uh, insulin, but generally it can be managed just by having a proper diet and exercising. So like type 1 diabetes, it's still a failure to respond to insulin and pull blood sugar or pull sugar out of the bloodstream, but the causes of the two are very different. Generally type 1 diabetes is only is found in children. Type 2 diabetes is not found in children. However, um, I'm sure you've heard of the American obesity epidemic. Type 2 diabetes is becoming much more common in children than it ever has been before. So I hope this video was a decent little overview of antagonistic pairs and some of the regulation in the endocrine system and certainly diabetes and blood sugar. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I'll see you again.